come back to the story in spiritual competencies. I was in San Diego, and the presenter said there's one question that he thinks every healthcare professional needs to ask the patients that they're dealing with. And that question is simply this. Is there one thing that I need to know about you as a person that's going to help me do a better job of taking care of you? Simple question. He said it's a question that could be asked by anyone. Certainly it could be asked by a chaplain. It could be asked by a doctor. It could be asked by a nurse. But it's a question that helps both the healthcare provider and the patient dial in immediately to their spirituality, their innate spirituality. And in so doing, it helps to promote better health. That's what today's panel discussion is going to be all about. That is spiritual competency in a nutshell. Not only does it have a great impact or can it have a great impact on the patient's health, but it can also help further the practice of medicine as a whole. So joining me today, a few folks that are going to tell you more about this uh, idea of spiritual competency, four individuals, and I will have to go to my notes on this because I haven't memorized their bios. First on my immediate left, we have Bruce Feldstein. Bruce is a chaplain, a medical educator, and former emergency medicine physician who introduced the first classes on spirituality and meaning in medicine here at Stanford University. He is also the founder and director of the Jewish Chaplaincy at Stanford's School of Medicine. To Bruce's left, we have Marilyn McIntyre. Marilyn is a writer and professor of medical humanities at the UC Berkeley UCSF Joint Medical Program. For the past 26 years, her work has included courses in medical humanities for undergraduates, medical students, and workshops for medical professionals. She's also written three books about the spiritual needs of patients and co-edited a volume of essays on teaching literature and medicine. And let me make sure you can see their names up here as well. There we go. To her left is Michael Cantwell. Michael is a board-certified pediatrician who sees both children and adults in his holistic medicine practice at San Francisco's Rising Phoenix Integrative Medicine Center. He is also the recipient of the 2013 USA Best Book Award for Alternative Medicine for his book, Map of the Spirit, Diagnosis and Treatment of the Spirit. And finally, we have Cassandra Veaton. Cassandra is President and CEO of the Institute of Noetic Sciences, a scientist in the Mind-Body Medicine Research Group at California Pacific Medical Center Research Institute in San Francisco, and co-author of the recently published book, Spiritual and Religious Competencies in Clinical Practice. And I'm Eric Nelson, and I'm the individual who pulled all these folks together. I'm the only one in the front of the room who doesn't have an MD or a PhD after my name. However, I have been writing for the last four and a half, five years. I've been writing a weekly column on the intersection between spirituality and better health from my perspective as a Christian science practitioner. And as part of that work, I've also had the great privilege of interviewing quite a number of prominent physicians, psychologists and medical researchers about this and, and other related topics. So that's how I fit in to the mix here. So now that you know about us, um, I want to touch just briefly on why we feel this panel discussion that we're about to have is important, not just to you as individuals, but truly to the future of medicine. There's four reasons we feel this. Number one is because patients, believe it or not, are spiritual and often religious people. And a few statistics to support this idea, 90%, 92% of those in the U.S. believe in God. Up to 59% report that religion is very important to them. 40% consider themselves very religious. 29% see themselves as at least moderately religious. And 80% identify with a particular religious practice. The second reason that we feel this is important is because patients and doctors want to talk about spirituality and religion. There was one survey taken, and I don't have it, I've got it in my notes here where the survey was taken, but in that survey, 77% of patients 
said that they believe that their physicians should consider their spiritual needs. In that same survey, 77% of the physicians said that they felt it was important for their patients to share their religious beliefs with them. The third reason we feel this is important is because doctors feel ill-prepared to address patients' spiritual needs. And related to this is the fact that most medical schools provide only minimal training. Now there's a couple of words that we're going to be throwing around probably fairly often uh, this morning, and I want to just sort of lay some ground level definitions for us to consider. The first word is religion. What do we mean when we say the word religion? We probably all have our own definitions, but for our conversation today, we'll assume that religion means an individual's affiliation with an organization that is guided by shared beliefs and practices. And a related word, spirituality. Again, we all have our own definitions of that, but for our purposes today, we'll assume that spirituality is the way you find meaning, hope, comfort, and inner peace in your life. Now, I don't want to give everything away, but I, somebody told me once that when you're giving a talk, you should tell people what you're going to say, then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. So I'm going to tell you what we're about to tell you here, our three takeaways for the day. And I'm going to leave all three of these up here so you can kind of keep us honest and make sure that we deliver on our promise. The first takeaway from our conversation today is the fact that patients want to engage with their health care providers on issues related to spirituality and are often benefited thereby. The second takeaway is that all healthcare providers are in a position to support the spiritual needs of their patients. And finally, there are resources available to help bridge the gap between what patients want and need and what healthcare providers feel that they can provide. Now, as the moderator, that means I get to ask all of the questions, or most of the questions. My first question actually is for you as the audience, and we don't have a microphone to pass around, so just sort of pipe up here. We're curious to know why you're here. What questions do you have? What questions do you hope we answer over the next 20 or 30 minutes here? Anyone? Yeah. Right. Good. Good. We have just the folks to answer that question. Can you repeat the question for the... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it is taped. Okay. Uh, the question was, you're interested in, in uh, mind-body connections, uh, as we are all aware that uh, medical tends to default to just the mechanical aspects of the patient and kind of leaves the mind-body-spirit stuff uh, off the table, or at least on the side of the table, if that's the gist of it. There was another one? Yeah. Mm hmm So the... That's bridging the gap between here's 10 top tips on how to deal with the patient's spirituality and actually putting that into practice and being engaged in that, what can sometimes often be a very uh, difficult conversation. Maybe we'll take a couple more, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A question of when. Do you kind of wait till somebody's sort of uh, lying on, on their bed and seems to be passing on and is that the time to kick in or should we bring it in much earlier? Great question. We'll take one more. We'll go to our panelist. Anyone else? Good. Right. 
yeah, you weren't, you weren't taught in a school and you're wanting to make that connection between spirituality and clinical medical practice. Well, the good news is there is a connection and we'll just kind of explore that a bit more deeply today. I'm going to see if we've got a second mic that we can use for our panelists. And Chuck, is that working? Good. So you guys can pass that one around. As a moderator, I get my own mic. Um, so I thought I would start off, thank you for your question. It gives us an idea we can kind of tailor our presentation a bit to, to your needs. Uh, what I'm going to start off doing is asking each of the panelists a question specific to their area of expertise. We're just going to go right down the line here, and we'll start with you, Bruce. Um, my guess is that for, for most medical students, anything having to do with religion or spirituality is seen as com really intimidating or completely uh, irrelevant. The question is, how do you help them overcome any resistance they might be feeling about uh, engaging with their future patients on, on this level? That's a great question. Uh, so as uh, Eric mentioned, I'm a chaplain. Uh, this is my second career. I was an emergency medicine physician, uh, including here at Stanford, where I helped found the Stanford Kaiser Emergency Medicine Residency. And I was also a visiting scholar here at the Center for Biomedical Ethics uh, until I tore two discs in my back and the spine surgeon said, you need to go find a new work style. And the question came up, well, what's next? And I wasn't going to just take a disability check and go to the beach or be a telephone triage doctor. So, well, that, but that's a, a much longer story. I, be, I went back and became a chaplain, would never have guessed and did my residency training, specialty training, and becoming a chaplain in spiritual care, and did it here at Stanford. Are some of you familiar with clinical pastoral education? Okay, well, if you hadn't heard of it, you just did. That's the specialty residency training to become a professional chaplain. And chaplains are people from any faith background or human background who are trained to provide, and we dedicate ourselves to providing spiritual and religious support for not only our patients, but their families, staff. There's also chaplains who are working with uh, police or in the community in a variety of settings. Um, I'm getting to you. I, no doubt. Your, your <laughs> and question. if you don't, I'll bring you back. Yeah. So during my residency here at Stanford, the, uh, my colleague Marita Grutzen, uh, head of the Center for Ethnogeriatrics. I throw that out so that it sounds like it's got you know academic stuff to it, which it really does. There's so much evidence now for this. It's not a question. It's really unquestionable, unequivocal about that uh, the importance and impact of uh, spirituality in medicine. And part of my work as a chaplain is that of education and design is bridging the gap between what we know what patients want, and then overcoming cultural barriers to this and a lot of bias to, and, and coming with ways as medicine has now become a biopsychosocial and spiritual understanding and practice, not only of medicine, but of, of health care. So we introduced the first course here at Stanford in 2001, Spirituality and Meaning in Medicine, a required class. We've gone on now to teach, I uh, direct uh, the healer's art and also a series of required um, education called reflection rounds where students on their clinical rotations like surgery, pediatrics, and others focus on their inner life experience. That's where they learn to talk about the emotions and the dread and the focus on themselves. Because when they get comfortable to be able to look at it, recognize it, and share it in the company of colleagues, then they become desensitized to it, detoxified to it, and they're able to respond with their patients in that moment. And even when they may not share the same background, they learn how to accompany people. Um, we titled our, so overcoming the, the, uh, the resistance. Distance, the re yeah. Most of our students are, 20% are, get an MD, PhD. These are people who come to Stanford, they are steeped in science, in technology, in engineering and also humanities, um, but they're steeped in science. So when we first termed it, we called it not spirituality in medicine, we called it spirituality and meaning in medicine. Who's again, who can argue with meaning in medicine, right? Nobody could argue with that. 
So we understand a little bit of the nature of the language, and my, my new friend here is going to talk a little about, uh, about that. And in this class, we go through the rationale that patients wanted. These statistics that Eric put up are from, um, one's from a classic paper from 2001. The majority of our patients want, in fact, they're, um, there's something really, there's a need to be able to talk about the spirituality, what matters most for them with their physicians and to be heard and listened to. Um, patients want it, the research shows, of, demonstrates this. I could speak about that, large volumes, multi-day conferences at the NIH and throughout. Uh, so the research shows that patients want it. The Joint Commission, which accredits hospital organizations, requires it. So it's not whether it's, it's no longer optional, it's a requirement. Part of palliative uh, care is to include the patient's spirituality. And if you're not providing that aspect of the biopsychosocial spiritual, as Betty Farrell and others say, then you're really not doing your job. And this is part of who we have and always been as physicians. It's part of the goals of medicine and our legacy to, how does the French physician say it, uh, Trudeau? What are the goals of medicine? Guérir quelquefois, to cure sometimes. Soulager souvent, to relieve often. Consoler toujours, to comfort always. That's always been what we've done and been able to do. Um, but we forget that in the era of science and technology and medicine. So really what we're doing in this talk and in bringing this back into uh, medical education is uh, I see it as a historical repair job. Well said. I was going to say too, as far as overcoming that uh, resistance to engage with this subject, certainly you can throw out the statistics and say now it's a requirement. But for those of you who were here yesterday and, and this morning to hear some of the talks, to me, there was one talk after another patients screaming out for some level of spiritual support. It really just threw me for a loop. In fact, at the very beginning of the conference, first line in the video, if you were here yesterday morning, first line in the video said, if we're not uh, dealing with the social support, which I might include the uh, spiritual support as well of patients, we're actually committing a medical error. That really threw me for a loop. So if, if students are looking for a reason to engage with this, we want to keep from committing uh, medical errors. Well, I was going to say, well, go ahead. And what, in, in, in teaching, the students really respond to a, hearing a personal story when a, a respected physician is at the bedside with a lady who's got metastatic cancer, and I'm there, and I have to give her the news that it's spread to the brain, and she says it's a death sentence. Tell them how I tried to reassure her, but it didn't happen, and I know I can't, and I, and I couldn't respond to her emotionally, because I don't know how she feels. And then, just by intuition, I knew I needed to pray. Now, I, at that time, I was a white coat, stethoscope wearing doctor. I didn't have one of these on my head. And, but that's what she needed, and my ethics says I need to accompany her in her world and meet her. And so, now I know how to do it, but at the time it was by intuition I offered, if, would she like to have a prayer? And she's from Mexico, she was twice my age. And she's Catholic from Mexico, I'm this Jewish guy from Detroit, right? But yet here <laughs> we were at the bedside. And so I offer the prayer, and, uh, and afterward the color has fully returned to her face, she has a tear down her eye, and she said to me, with a kind of gratitude like I have never heard before, she said, Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Like I had just given her the best cure, drug, or something. Um, and that's when I discovered in, for myself uh, as an emergency physician the real power, and it, it's right there about spirituality. Good. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Marilyn, tell us about the language of spirituality. We've already thrown out a bunch of words here. We said religion, spirituality, God, prayer, even the word spirit. I think often in conversations we think the other person knows what we mean when we say that word. I assume I know what Bruce means when he said the word prayer. Is that a fair assumption that we're all using the same words in the same way? No. Good. Next question. <laughs> I'm kidding. 
No, it's not. And one of the things that I talk with medical students about all the time is language. Um, I, I did an experiment with a group of 16 of them at the JMP recently where we were looking at the, the, question, the joint medical program that um, you mentioned. I worked at the UCSF UC Berkeley joint medical program. And I said, um, if you're in the room with someone who's dying, it's late at night, the chaplain's gone home, the nurses are preoccupied somewhere else, you're the only person around, and this patient says, hey, doc, would you pray with me? What are you going to do? And I heard an audible intake of air. <laughs> like, well, the very first response was, that's not my job. And I said, okay, it's not your job, but there you are. What are you going to do? And so what ensued was a pretty reflective conversation. People said, well, someone said, I might say, let me sit here quietly with you while you pray. Somebody said, I guess I would ask, what is your tradition? Um, and someone said, well, most people from my tradition know the Lord's Prayer. I could say that with them, or the 23rd Psalm, or I could read this or that, or I could um, talk with them. But then we got into the matter of talking with them and how people hear words like God, names for God, how people hear the word Christian, I was talking about this earlier, Christian is such a toxic word for a lot of people now that even if you are one, a lot of us tend to avoid it because you kind of want to follow it with, but not like that. You know, it's, it's been associated with a particular bandwidth of political um, beliefs. So that's hard. But all words have histories. Spirit and spirituality have histories. And so one of the things I think is part of the education and practice of spirituality in medicine is to talk about the language. How do you hear the word spirit? How do you hear the word body-mind or body-mind-spirit? How do you normalize the language of the body-mind relationship? Um, how do you shift the categories? And sometimes I have found that if you just listen to how someone puts something and then shift the frame a little bit and say, so is this what you mean? and you offer them another word, it opens a door. Oh yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way before. So someone earlier said, well, the words don't really matter, and I just jump on that. Yes, they do. They really do matter, but the definitions are so slippery that we have to attend to the words themselves so that we can um, ensure the deepest understanding we can get to. I wrote a book some years ago called Caring for Words in a Culture of Lies, and I think we do live in one, and we really have to pay attention to stewardship of language. I think the language of evidence-based medicine needs to keep raising the question, well, what do we talk about when we talk about evidence? Is human testimony evidence? Is someone's story about how they feel a form of credible evidence? Do you have to, if, it, if you can't measure it, does it matter? And if it does matter, but you can't measure it, what do you do with that? So recently, I've been working on a um, project that will be an article or maybe grow up to be a book, just about physicians' experiences of intuitive moments or epiphanic moments. Somebody warned me when I began this that doctors don't like the word intuition. And so we begin with that, and some of them don't. But I've had doctors say, well, I don't have those kinds of experiences. And even if I did, you know, that's not something I work with. And then we talk for an hour, and they've had a lot of them. I did test out a, a list of words with a group of physicians and nurses at a recent conference and said, just, just kind of sit with how this word registers. One of the words was intuition. Um, one was epiphany. One was hunch. One was feeling, all that kind of stuff. And then I got to the word energy. And this woman from the Midwest immediately said out loud in this group of 50 people, I would never say that. I thought, really? <laughs> you know, I think energy is fine. Energetics, I can see why people might not go there. But for her, even talking about someone's energy, and I would give examples, as in his energy changed when I walked into the room. That wasn't something she felt comfortable doing. So a lot of what we do around language is examine the comfort zones, how you hear it, how you react to it, and then to talk about the meta-conversation. 
when I talk about God with you, or when you say God, how do you think about God? How are you taught to think about God? How are you experiencing that now? It doesn't take more than an extra 30 seconds to ask a question about the word you just used. And sometimes just talking about the one word is enough to deepen the conversation. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh, actually, if you could hold on to it, I'll let, and if we could, we'll keep moving along, because I do want to get to audience questions, so hold on to that for just a moment. But I'll go to you now, Michael. You're the only uh, practicing physician on the panel right now. And my question for you is, um, and Marilyn, you started to touch on this, but the, the kind of results, the kind of benefits that come from engaging with patients vis-a-vis -vis their, their spirituality. It's, you know, it's one thing having a great, meaningful conversation, but if you're not seeing any results, even physical impact of that, what, what's the point? So if you could speak to that. To uh, really get to the point, um, raise your hand if you think you're only a body. Raise your hand if you think you're a body and a mind only. Raise your hand, what one? And raise your hand if you think you're a body, mind, and something else. Now I've asked this question to students, patients, physicians, and the response is the same. People do not like to be viewed as only bodies. We have a very reductionistic healthcare system. People are not happy with that, and that, on the good side, it pays my bills. As a holistic physician, my job is to really look for stresses and imbalances in people's lives. And because we know at this point that stress and the inflammation and immune dysfunction that it produces is what kills us. We are dying because of stress. All of the, with the possible, with the exception of, of medication deaths, all of the deaths of the common leading causes of death in America are stress related. Cardiovascular disease, cancer, autoimmune diseases, traumatic and accidental deaths. These are all stress related diseases. In the 90s, we began to experience and understand that stress could not just be only physiologic, but also psychological. And that was the first expansion from body medicine into mind body medicine. There's a lot of people living currently who are not living in harmony or alignment with their spiritual beliefs or their meaning and purposes. For those people, that produces what I would call spiritual stress. All you have to do is expand your concept of stress to include spiritual stress in addition to physiological and psychological stress. That imbalance of not living out their spiritual beliefs produces a stress in their body that is just as much of a component to causing disease as physiologic and psychological stress. We have a lot of data showing that religiosity improves healthcare outcomes. Interesting parts about that data show that the greater people's faith and also the greater they perceive their own peacefulness, the greater is that positive effect. What we need now is to be able to expand, since not everyone is, quote, religious, we need to expand the religious term as the, vo the vocabulary is important to a greater sense of what would be spirituality so we can study the effect of this greater spirituality on people's health. But as a holistic physician, I'm a holistic physician. A hundred years ago, all physicians were holistic. We didn't have any medicines. Most of our medicines were useless. We didn't have that much. Now we believe we have things at work, and I certainly take things that have helped my health that are physiologic. But I'm a holistic doc is really what a doc used to be, a person who actually looks at the causes of stress in their patients, in their body, mind, or even I'm now asking you to consider their meaning and purpose of their spiritual beliefs. The goal of this is not just to make them live longer, although that probably happens based on the data, but the goal is also to live more joyfully and peacefully. Here, I'll give you an option. You can live longer, but you won't be joyful during that time. I'm not about prolonging your sentence of misery. This is about living your life in as most joyful and peaceful way you can. That's holistic medicine. And that is what patients are looking for. They do not want to be viewed just as bodies. And most of them don't just want to be viewed as bodies and minds. We had that wonderful talk this morning. I forget the young woman's name uh, who was, had the, the chronic pain saying, I'm a patient. I'm not a disease. I'm not, I'm a, yeah, I'm a, I'm a patient, but I'm not a disease. Patients don't want to be defined by their disease. So, Cassie, you've been immensely patient. Uh, when you and I were talking a few months ago about this panel discussion, 
I was really surprised when you said uh, that um, uh, mental health professionals, psychologists, psychiatrists, have actually been fairly slow in coming to this idea of dealing with patient spirituality, much slower, surprisingly, than medical doctors. Why is that? Well, I think all health care providers have a few barriers to integrating either mind-body medicine or spiritual or religious aspects of people's well-being into their practice. And those are mainly three things. One is that they don't feel like they have the evidence or the knowledge or the ability to get their minds around the literature that's out there. The second is that they don't have the skills or the training to do it, so they don't know how to ask the question or when or what they should say very um, pragmatically. And the third is that they don't feel like they have the time. So when you are all, if you are all going into practice, it's certainly a barrier when you think, okay, I've got 15 minutes, and if I ask a question and somebody starts crying, or if I open up a giant can of religious worms, I'm not going to know what to do with it, and I've got to run out of the room in two minutes. So that goes back to the skills, too, um, because there are skills that you can teach to say, you know, I've only got 60 seconds left with you, but I want to spend that 60 seconds asking you, for you, what's the meaning of the illness that you're bringing to me? Or do you have any spiritual resources that can help you? But even just that beginning of setting that 60-second boundary is great, because even if they do have a problem or start talking or start crying, you say, okay, well, the 60 seconds is up. I'm happy to refer you to X, Y, Z. But you've asked the question, you've brought that part into the room. So in terms of mental health and psychology professionals, they not only have those barriers, they also have the barrier of kind of feeling like their science is already denigrated a little bit and a little bit of a soft science. So whatever is happening inside someone's mind or emotions or their spirituality is invisible and imaginary and therefore perhaps not important. And everything that's happening in the physical world is 25 times more important than those. Well, as Michael said, we're starting to learn that's not true, that what is happening inside your mind, your emotions, and your spiritual and religious beliefs, your attitudes, the way you make meaning of whatever's happening to you is at least as important, if not more important, than what's happening as a symptom in the body. And the reason for that is partly what Michael said about stress and the way things are processed in the mind affects the body, but it also has to do with behavior. So I think you all know that probably among the top 10 diseases, 80% or 90% have to do with our behavior. People act in ways that are dictated by their priorities and their motivations and the support they have for staying in tune with their long-term goals rather than their short-term goals or in addition to their short-term goals. So if we can help people orient themselves around value-driven and purpose and meaning-driven behaviors, that includes their health behaviors. And that is tied inextricably to what they think happens when you die why they're having an illness, is there something beyond just mechanism in my world, or is there some kind of divinity holding me, am I interconnected with people in the world, and you know, what brings, where do I find sacredness and joy and meaning and purpose? So it seems like these things are sort of a luxury, or they're maybe like a side thing that somebody can do after they've dealt with everything else, when in fact they're foundational to people's health, and especially their mental health. Well said. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go with the, the time we have. I actually had a boatload of questions I would love to ask, but it's um, important to get to your questions, and you've been even more patient, so I'll go to you. Great. Well, thank you uh, so much. I actually got millions of questions, but uh, I do want to focus in on this um, sort of area of, of, of stress and mind-body connectivity. Uh, you know, there's so much we don't know. We, we don't understand uh, spontaneous remissions. Uh, we don't understand, uh, I forget the word starts with P, but the, the effect that, you know, if you tell somebody they're going to get well, they get well. P placebo effect. Uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> that was an example of group community uh, problem solving. Um, and I, do, I, I think I really agree with you that, you know, modern society creates so much stress and we're not really... I mean, we train to respond quickly or, or um, to danger or opportunity, and we get the types of prolonged stress that eat away at the immune system, and that triggers um, cortisol and adrenaline, the stress hormones. The opposite is, are the relaxation hormones, the EDSO hormones. 
And it kind of gets back to Marilyn. I guess where I was originally wanted to ask the question was um, conversation. You know, there, there's a big difference between caregivers and great healers. And I think care or healers by definition have very high degree of empathy. And you're talking to these um, very scientifically oriented, cut and dry, show me the evidence kind of doctors. And I sometimes think we could heal more people than whatever the next greatest uh, discovery is if we just taught people how to talk to patients as human beings. And in your work with students, uh, do you have to try and trigger uh, a sense of empathy and, and how to sort of bring that out so that the spiritual part of the healing process can, can go forward? I think the students are really open to it. I don't think that I have to do very much work to get them there. But I think they're all concerned about time, which came up if you've got 60 seconds or if you've got two minutes. What's the, I loved your saying, you can bring the question into the room. Or you can put something on the table. You can say, I wonder if you've looked at um, how, how does your faith help you? Or you mentioned that you were, you know, you have on this form that you were raised Catholic. Do you still practice? Does that matter to you? But just to open the door sometimes is enough. But we also practice having a two-minute conversation. If you had one question, you know, Eric, you were talking about if there's one question to ask your patient, here's what it might be. But I know that Rita Sharon, who works at Columbia, has worked on what she calls the um, alternative chart. And one of the questions she raises is if, you, is if you just had two extra minutes with a patient to ask them something outside the box, what might that be? And so to craft these questions and really work on a question that reframes or opens a door or takes someone a little bit by surprise or reintroduces a word they might be afraid of or might be surprised to hear in a medical context, all of that is quite possible, even within the parameters of a very short visit. And I just had one more thing is to attend to your own presence. So the moment where you can put the chart down, put the pen down, step away from the screen, which is now what many of us are doing as professionals, is sitting and typing and looking into a screen with your back to the patient while you ask all the questions. So it's just taking that screen aside, sitting down across from someone at an eye-to-eye -eye level and saying, what are these questions? Is there anything else you want me to know about you? Or I've got two minutes. Is there anything about your spiritual practice? Or you know, your, this, where, do you, where do you feel most peaceful and safe in your world right now? Well, I go hiking. Great. I recommend that in addition to the prescription I just gave you, you go hiking. We'll go to Bruce, and then we'll take another uh, couple of questions. Go ahead, Bruce. I, I like to teach the students. They're trained. I, I, my starting point, they're trained when they see the patient to uh, identify the patient's chief complaint. What is it that brings you in? And then there's a whole paradigm of thinking. Uh, what I like to do is uh, we've introduced the time to identify not just the chief complaint, but the chief concern. So the chief complaint, what is it that brings you in? What prompts you to come in today? Okay. And then the chief concern, well, what is it about this that prompts you to come in now? What is it about this? And so that elicits the story. It makes a, um, a modulation, for those of us who are musical, from the key of the technology and the information into the key of meaning. Um, and in so doing, what is it, so what is it about this? I'm listening for the story, and in the story is all the emotions and like, well, you know, what's your bottom line? And behind it for me is what matters for you is what matters for me. And so just some of these little simple things, uh, simple attitudes and shifts um, helps to open up this whole um, dimension, including the the empathy, the caring uh, from me as a clinician to you um, as my patient. Hopefully we can get to two more questions, but I'm going to just add on to that. As an example, we were talking the other day, Bruce, chief complaint may be somebody walks into a hospital and says, I've got a heart problem. What's your chief concern? I'm not going to make it to my granddaughter's wedding next week. Let's take care of that. And, and even having a doctor take a moment to say, you're not going to have to worry about that. that that was a 10-second interchange that can go very far in addressing 
the root of, of the problem there. And that was a deeply spiritual conversation. We didn't even say God, prayer, or, or anything. And look what happened. Yeah, right to Goes the to the meeting. We'll take uh, two more, at least two more questions. We've only got a couple minutes. Okay. Thank you. I will try to do it short. Um, so thanks for the lecture and the very interesting subject. Um, I'm uh, working uh, with a project uh, for a few years that uh, trying to uh, uh, combine the spiritual world into, uh, I'm an engineer, so I'm taking it to my world for the business and IT and trying to combine why, why it's important, why, why in the day by day life it's important to have the spirituality and what is it. And I'm also teaching in a, a university in Israel about uh, in psychology school and also in business school. And uh, actually, it's very amazing to see that we have like the same shared uh, question. And my big question that I'm usually having in my mind all the time, because for me, spiritual is something that we don't know. Like you have asked, uh, we have the body and mind and something else. And do we believe it's something else? So maybe part of us do believe, but we don't know what it is. But it's starting from a belief that we know that we are not just a body and there is something else. And it's very difficult to, uh, to convince uh, uh, a doctor that working according to a clinical trial and proof and evidence that there is something that if he will use as part of a treatment, it will be better. But what is something they are not used to have it like as a tool that they don't have evidence. It's like a pill that uh, I will give the doctor a pill. I will get, this is doing it good for the patient, but I don't know what it's doing. I don't know what it is. You can use it. There is no clinical trial. Nobody will use it. So then they have, it's a belief zone. It's not a science zone anymore. And we are scientists and uh, we are dealing with science. And this is uh, how we heal people usually. And we want to add this aspect. So. My question is, um, how can we provide this tool and convince the doctor or the engineer or the manager to, to take it into account, to use it, to be part of you, to be part of the communication, even if you don't know what it is, if you, if you don't have proof? And what I'm usually trying to research now with a, a few students is that uh, trying to, uh, to practice it, like to feel it to try to, to add it and see what it does. It's like a practice zone. It's, it's, it's nothing about like the science. So my question is, how, uh, how do you do it? How do you uh, uh, convince the doctor to use something that maybe it's not part of the set of beliefs? Well, my brief response to that is that there are in fact hundreds of published clinical trials and um, hard science showing that spiritual engagement and religious involvement and spiritual practices enhance health. So attempting to perhaps present the scientific evidence for the engagement in these practices as uh, health promoting might be helpful. We also talked a little bit about the belief in the placebo response. Once I went to a whole weekend, we had a whole weekend conference on the placebo. And it's interesting that the placebo response can be modified. It can be modified depending on how good the communication and the quality of the communication is between the patient and the, and the prescriber. So you can get up to as, perhaps a 70% cure rate or as low as a 20% cure rate depending on the communication and how you present things in your words. And unfortunately, I would actually include a course in rhetoric in medical school also. <laughs> Because what we say and how we say it is either potentially harmful and destructive or potentially remarkably curative. I, what, I, what I love about the question is it really does put the onus on the individual. You can't have a doctor saying, gosh, I wish my institution would just get their act together. There's things that, and I think getting to the heart of your question, there, there, are there things that we can be doing right now, this afternoon, that's going to make me a better doctor or whatever you're, however you're in, involved in this, in this subject, what's going to make me a better person to be able to dial into that individual spirituality and be a real and immediate and measurable benefit to them this afternoon? I gonna... think of one very small personal practice that might be useful, which is after an encounter to ask yourself, what did I observe? And then what did I notice? And then what did I witness? 
Just the shifting of those words moves your own sense of what the transaction was to a new place from which you can then begin to speak. And doctors are already good at that. They've been trained to notice lots of things. Maybe Just not to add a few more things to the list of what you're noticing. Were you going to say something, Bruce? I'm thinking about blessing. And there's one question that I, I love to ask to uh, offer a blessing to people, and I'll just offer it to you. After our, our wonderful conversation today, what could I wish for you? What could I wish for you today? That's a blessing, a prayer, uh, a hope. And I know if, you ta if I say it in a certain way where it's really sincere, which it is, and you take it seriously, I know whatever words that you say back are really words of your truth. Mm -hmm. words coming from your heart. Yeah. In my tradition, or many, we, we call that prayer. But it doesn't matter what you call it, it's, it's good. And so if I ask you, you know, what can I wish for you today? And you take it seriously, and then I say yes, plus whatever you can even put into words. And, and also what you're going to think of in five minutes from now, that too. I think that's a beautiful way to wrap things up. We've actually gone a little bit over time. We're, all, are, we're going to stick around and be out in the hallway here, but we need to make room for the next, uh, the next panel. But thank you all for, for being here today.